And this is the price of the market. And yeah, you've got the company, and then you've got the price of the company. Now, everyone in the room knows about this. Everyone knows about that. Because when you look at your statement, or if you look at anything, you're going to be able to be happy because your price is up, or you're going to be sad because your price is lower. And as long as you are an emotional investor going up with the ups and downs, you're going to be neurotic, you're going to have to be on medications, and you're going to be complaining day in and day out. There's absolutely zero control that anybody has over the price of a company or of the market. There's no, absolutely no one that can tell you where the price of a company is going to. And as long as you have that as an expectation that you do know where the price is going to, you're going to be a miserable investor. Okay, so if, for example, the price does go up above what you paid for your company, you're going to be happy. And that's why, of course, that's our goal. But your goal cannot be one in which it's short term. If you're going to have a short term goal that, you know what, in the next six months, I'm going to make all the money that I need on this particular company. Your uh, clearness of thinking, your thinking clearly is basically off because you have no control over how a price gets there. There are emotional reasons why people buy and why people sell. Everyone's worried about the market crashing, so everybody decides to sell. It's a perfect formula to do that. When the market crashes, you just sell your portfolio. It's a wonderful idea. Because basically what you're doing is you're jumping off a roller coaster when it's moving. And you can see what the consequences to that are. If you visualize it, you can just see you've probably broken your bones and you've done everything wrong. You cannot be an emotional investor. One of the hope, hopefully one of the things that we help you with is to try and not be emotional while you're investing and that you're looking at something else that you can have a real connection to. So over here, the identification over here is that here you are a trader yeah, you, owe, you buy stocks because you feel like it. Over here, you also buy things because somebody else told you to buy it. Buy this. It's got a great deal. It's going to go up. It's going to be wonderful. You've got no real basis to know why. It's going to get bought out. Yeah, it's going to get bought out. How do you know? No one knows that, but no one wants to ever do the second level of thinking. So everyone thinks that they've got the greatest idea. I remember when I first got into the business, I couldn't believe how many ideas people had. Everyone had an idea. Oh, this is the best company I've ever heard of. Oh, really? Yeah, buy it, buy it. We went up, we went down. We sa maybe you made money, maybe we didn't make money. But there was no real basis in trying to find out what you're doing. Now, there is another way of looking at... So this one over here is what everybody does. This is the talking heads on uh, CNBC. These are the guys that are telling you what to buy, what not to buy. Jim Cramer and all of that, what to buy, what not to buy. And a lot of people follow him. And sometimes they, they hit it and sometimes they don't. There is also a thing called beginner's luck that happens with most things in life. You'll buy something and suddenly it will go up. People start doing options and everything else like that. But it doesn't work out. The net result at the end of the day doesn't work out. If you look at all the smart money, the people that have really made serious money, have an identification with the companies that they're involved with, which is totally different. And this is what I want to try and instill upon you that this is the way that we invest in. So if your portfolio value is trading up and down, we should not care. We should not care about that. But for sure, this is going to happen all the time, going up and down. If you're in this particular stage of investing, it's probably best that we don't work together. Just a very candid comment. I'll tell you why. Watch this now. Where should your eye be? Your eye should be somewhere else. You've bought a company. What's the company's name? I don't want to take any of our, the greatest companies on earth because otherwise they might get swollen head before we had the conversation. But let's just say we took a company called A, B, and C, which is really a boring, everyone uses that. So we've got a company called A, B, and C. A, B, and C has in the bank $1 million. Now that $1 million there's one million shares outstanding. So if you have one million dollars in the bank and no liabilities, you know that each share is worth one dollar. Anyone disagree with that? 
if you take that $1 million of this ABC company and you're sitting with a million dollars over there and you've got a million shares, each share is worth $1. It would fit under this category over here. Now what happens is a friend of yours comes up to you and says, you know what, I love your company, ABC. I mean, I've never heard a more original name. It's got to be better than any of the other stuff. I would like to buy it from you. You say, fine, okay, I'm very happy to do that, and thank you for coming along. But what I'll pay you is 75 cents. Or are you going to be a seller? I don't know why you wouldn't be. If you want to lose money, you sell. Okay? So you would sell at this level if you wanted to lose. Go into the negative, you'd go and you would sell. But you would never sell it. Logically, while we're talking about it now, there's no reason why you would sell. You'd be called an idiot for selling because if you sold, you'd be selling it at a loss. Why do you need to sell it? Because if you wanted to, you could go to the bank, take out all the money out of the bank, get a million dollars, and then you've got your money back. Now let's just say that the money in the bank grows for whatever reason, you've got an investment, and it now goes to $2 million. The price of the share over here is still a dollar. But it's, it's got $2 million in the bank. person comes to you and says, you know what? I super have offered you a 75 cents. I'll offer you a dollar now. I'll buy one of your shares for a dollar. Would you sell? Obviously, you wouldn't, simply because... Your share value is $2. Can you see the difference between seeing what the value is of the company as opposed to the value of the share price? How people value shares and everything like that, you should not care about it. All you should care about is what is the value of this particular company over here. Now, each of the companies that we've had here today have a greater value, what the company is worth, than what other people are pricing it at. So what should I be concerned about? Should I be concerned that the stock price is going down while the value of the company is going up? Or should I be concerned that the value of the company is going down and the stock price is going up? Your eye should always be here. This is where we are. We have to be watching the company. So you now become a business owner. You own the company. You don't own shares in a company. You own the actual company. The identification that you have with your investment is totally different than if you're saying I own shares in a company. If you're owning shares in the company, you're going to have an emotional swing like this. We'll have a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists having better business. And believe me, they are. Because people are relying on false measures of value. So the point that we have to get through to you today, hopefully, is the idea that the companies that we are invested in are valid companies. There's only two things to look at when you've got a company. First of all, what you have to look at, which is the most important metric, uh, is who the heck is running these companies? Who are these guys? Are they honest? Do they have integrity? Do they have the ability? To, have they been successful before? Is it going to be a fluke? You know, are they here to promote or whatever? Is there actual facts that you can get out of it? I'm, I'm extremely proud and grateful for each one of the individuals that are on the panel today for the coming year. They've got busy days, they've got busy schedules. And they came here today for, in appreciation to you who have made an investment in their companies and to explain to you how well they are doing. Now understand one thing. What has to be understood is that we, the management, is going to be talking about this side. They cannot talk about this side. If a person wants to pay less for what the value is of their company, so what? They'll continue making it valuable, and at the right time, the intrinsic value or the real value of the company will be recognized, if not today, if not tomorrow, it will be in a two months, three months, four months. Some people have got a very, very uh, long horizon in terms of investing. Most people, when they come on board, they're very excited because they, woke, they went to bed the previous night and they heard about this guy that made a lot of money in the market, and they come and they say, Ivan, please, could we invest? Fine. How long is your uh, time horizon? Oh, yeah, long term. Great. Uh, what's long term? Five years? Seven years? Okay, good. Very good. The level of commitment or the level of actual believing of what they said is as shallow as tissue paper. I've seen it happen three or four times. People come six months later, you know, uh, I want to buy a house. 
I need to liquidate. Oh, but our stocks are down. So? The stocks are down, but the company value is up. You want to go and buy your house and you want to use the money from this? Probably misplace ideas or thinking. So this is what we have to be able to understand is that we're talking about the value of the company, how valuable are the companies that are sitting here today versus what you can buy them for in the marketplace. There's a great relationship between these two. You want to be able to buy things at a discount. When you go into a store and you, a person says to you they're going to give you a 50% discount on buying a suit, you're all very excited because that's the suit that you wanted. But when a person tells you you can buy 50% of a company, but you had paid a dollar for it before, and now, you have to pay, you, now you're going to pay 50 cents, you're losing. You don't want to do that. Why? There's something that's not connected in the head. We want to buy things of value, and that's what we have to try and identify. We have to identify with the value. Will we be able to do that today? Let's see what happens. Management is here today to answer any questions that you possibly might have about investing. Uh, some of you have come here with certain expectations from the meeting. Uh, we hope we're going to meet those expectations because we're going to have a panel now. And the panel is about the gold industry. I wanted to share with you why we are invested in gold. Anyone that you tell that you invested in gold will tell you that you have to have your head red. And the reason why you have to have your head red is because over here, gold is a fluctuating commodity. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes sideways, it goes whatever way it goes. None of these managements can tell you where gold is going. Jim Cramer can't tell you where gold is going. The gurus can't tell you where gold is going, and neither can anybody. Warren Buffett, no one can tell you where gold is going. No one can tell you where the stock markets are going. So as soon as you hear from a person that says, you want to know something, gold's going to 2,000. And I'm telling you now, it is so common in our, mar in our world that we live in that people make statements without a basis of fact. How do you know it's going to 2,000? How do you know it's going to 500? How do you know anything? But if you say it with a great deal of confidence that Dalradian is going to $15, Probe is going to $10, Northern Empire is going to $25, and I say it with a great deal of confidence with no basis in fact, but you believe it, that's responsibilities on you. You have to be able to say, well, prove it to me. Today we'll be able to prove it to you. Now the other question that you have is, okay, so I'm investing in gold. Why do I like gold? I'm not a gold bug. I couldn't care much about gold as such. Do I like gold? Yeah. If I get a gold coin, I look at it, I feel it, it feels good. I know it's worth 1,200, 50, 1,300 or whatever. I know it's valuable. Gold is from the biblical times. We know in, in the Bible it mentions gold, it mentions silver, it mentions all of that. Anything that you want to adorn or to make into something really special, like a palace, I'll put some gold in the palace, anything that you want to beautify or to make more, gold is a thing. You don't find cryptocurrencies necessarily going on uh, in a building to show that it's, it's more uh, worthy than that. Gold has got a place. If you don't think it's got a place, look to India, look to Asia. They love gold. Now the question is, you can invest in gold in many ways. You can buy coins, you can buy bullion, which is big amounts of gold. You can do all of that, or you can buy companies that have gold. So there's a very, a, a very difficult process, and I'm sorry, I don't want to spend too much time, but I do want to explain this because I think it's going to help today's meetings. Each one of the companies that we have here today are called gold exploration companies. These are the guys that go out and find the gold. Now, if you and I had a piece of land that was sitting in DeSoto, Texas, or North Dallas, or in Bastrop, or whatever, and we went to go and find gold, what would you think? Would you, anyone would invest with us? No. You would have an empty piece of land like this, and you'll find geologists, and they'll go and try and find some gold. It's a very difficult place to be, to find gold. How do you know where to find gold? The Earth's crust is so complex, there's so many minerals, there's so much in there, so that's why you have to get a geology degree, and some people are more talented than other people, just like in any other profession. You'll find a good accountant, you'll find a mediocre accountant, you'll find a great investment advisor, you'll find a lousy investment advisor. Everyone's got certain talents. All I can tell you is that the people that are here today have got a nose for finding gold. So why do I buy gold? Because let's say we find the gold over here, and if you find the gold and you find a nice amount, the price of your 
share of this particular company will get valued greatly if you find something worthwhile. Now, once you find the gold, and then let's just say you find a lot of it, and then somebody buys you out, and these guys that are buying you out want to process the gold. They're just so happy about processing gold. They want to be able to get the ore. They want to be able to draw out all the minerals from that particular thing. They want to put it through a mill. Then they want to go through. It is a huge process. You have to have engineering degrees. You have, it's a very difficult and costly process. So you have over here, like the big companies like Barrick, you have all <coughs> Gold Corp, all these big companies, uh, Kinross, buying up production companies in order to process it, to make, to be production, to produce gold. This is the last place that you want to be. I don't want to be there and you shouldn't want to be there because it is just too much, too many moving targets, too difficult to run the business. Some years you might make money, some you won't. If you find a real valuable deposit of gold that's for real, it's not so easy to find gold. One little point that I want to make, so just understand that this is where I, my interest is. This is where I believe the money is made. If you find a real deposit, somebody's going to want it. Because here is a little statistic on average. The average gold producing mine is producing gold at 1.03 grams per ton. So it's difficult to hear these numbers if no one puts it into a picture form. But imagine you've got a Kruger Rand, you've got an American, uh, you've got a Canadian Maple Leaf, you've got the American Eagle, it's gold coin, it's one ounce. That means that it's got 28 grams, approximately, of gold, that it needs to have that. So that means that they have to take out 28 tons of rock, 28 tons of rock to get one ounce. Who wants to be in that business? I don't think too many people. You can see it's highly capital intensive. It costs a lot of money to be able to process it. So what the only way that you can beat this is if you can find high-grade gold. Take a little company like a little company in Northern Ireland, Dalradian. They have like, I think, 15 grams per tonne. If you have 15 grams per tonne, you only have to take out two tonnes of rock versus 28 tonnes of rock. Now, raiding is underground. Then you look at Probe. They've got two grams, approximately a little bit more than two grams of gold in an open pit. You don't have to go underground. You just load the trucks up, take the ore out, process it, very inexpensive, particularly depending on the jurisdiction that you're in. So that is where we want to be. We want to be in this particular area. That's what we're talking about is exploration companies. We couldn't give a damn about the... Producers, all we want is that the producers should be smart enough to buy our companies if they, are, if they have any smarts about it because there's a value proposition. So that is what we're talking about. That's why we're talking about gold. What I wanted to do is that the gold market is all over the place. We have very seasoned people that have been in the gold play space for a long time. I wanted to open up the floor for you to be able to ask any questions that you want about gold. You might even say, to them, well, where's gold going? And then if they tell you where it's going, you know that they're lying because they don't know. <laughs> okay? I don't want to force the, the thing on that, but generally that's going to be the case. So um, if does anyone have questions, let me just by way of introduction, Marla Gale is with Dalradian. Dalradian, just so you know, is a deposit in Northern Ireland. No one even knew that, Dal uh, that gold was to be found in Northern Ireland, but it's an extremely rich project that is... Unbelievable. Patrick is the geologist and the founder of this uh, company. He's been there since 2010. Previously, he had found an amazing gold deposit as well in um, which country? Ecuador. <laughs> and in Ecuador, he found an amazing deposit. And over there, it was bought out by Kinross, made a nice sum of money. And uh, I would have liked to have made that amount of money. Okay, so that's what, uh, so Patrick is with Dalradian, and Dalradian's got a great story to tell as well. With us as well, we have Yves Desrolles. Uh, it's French, I don't know how to say it properly, is it more or less? Uh, it's not bad. <laughs> okay, so Eve and uh, Jamie, Eve and Dave are all with Probe. Jamie is 
I would say within the group, the more seasoned person within the group for what he's done. He was formerly the CEO with, uh, with Barrick. He's on the board of Agnico Eagle, which is one of the most premier gold mining companies that are producing companies that are the most successful out of anyone. Jamie sits on the board on that as well. Jamie jo joined Probe. As soon as Jamie and, and Dave tied up together, everything happened. Eve now is the engineer. Dave cannot tell me how more, every time that I speak to him, how diligent he is in terms of engineering and getting to know, getting down to the details of things. Jamie's gonna be able to give you a big overview of the gold industry from a big point of view. He can tell you probably what big companies are looking for in junior companies, which are the companies that we're in. And then Eve, from a technical point of view, you can ask him, and if you speak French, you can ask him as well in French. Okay, and then you have Dave, and then you, what, what we have now is a new company. A company that we haven't invested in, but has been told to me by three or four people that Northern Empire is the company to look at. Now understand something, we have Dalradian, which is in Northern Ireland. We have Probe, which is in Canada, in Quebec. Then we also have Northern Empire, which is in Nevada, in the United States. Northern Empire, I know very little about. I do know, though, that with, um, with the management of uh, Northern Empire have been highly successful. I mean, you talk about Kirkland Lake and all those, where they started off companies, they've made a, a massive amount of money for their clients and that, and they are in a new jurisdiction in Nevada, uh, well not new in terms of uh, being, a, it's been a gold zone that's very, very promising, but he's here to tell us about Northern Empire, a new entity, something for us to consider. In front of you, and then we have Tom Gallo, who is an analyst who follows all three companies. And he has them as a short. He doesn't believe in them, he doesn't like any of three of them. <laughs> and so he's here to counter whatever management says. So we'll see, uh, he says like, no, they're not telling you whatever the case is. Anyway, so this is our panel. We have the opportunity now to ask them any questions that you want about the gold space, any questions that you feel you would like to know as an opening. Or me, whatever. Okay, so I'll tell you what, what I think is valuable about questions that you need to ask is, how do you even get into the business? W Jamie, why did you come? Like a great question I think would be, if you don't mind me directing to you, Jamie, since you are the senior one in the group, just by color of hair, not by, by age. <laughs> <laughs> when you, you became the chairman, imagine coming off from being the CEO of a $10 billion company and then joining Probe, which at the time, well, for the new company, it started off with maybe $17 million. Why would you take such a, uh, a low grade, <laughs> no, high grade position in a low grade company that's like maybe doing never as big as Barrick or of the prominence of Barrick? If you don't mind me, like you must have an answer to that, I'm sure. Okay. Well, thanks, Ivan. Um, uh, I, I spent uh, over 20 years at Barrick. Um, as the CFO primarily and then the CEO uh, for the last few years. And uh, when I left Barrick, uh, I was approached uh, to see if I was interested in joining this company called uh, Probe Mines. And I really didn't know that much about it. And I went uh, in a on a plane to uh, Timmins in northern Ontario. And... Uh, Dave met me in his F-150 pickup truck, which he still drives in the city of Toronto. Yeah. And, it, and we drove up a couple of uh, uh, hours up to uh, uh, a, a little town called Shaplow. And I was so impressed with the enthusiasm, uh, the knowledge, um, and the focus that Dave had. And I, I met Eve as well. Um, and they had a tiger by the tail. And uh, Dave uh, had found something where people never thought there was going to be any gold. And um, I was 
um, I spent the, the day with, uh, with Dave and uh, I was um, so thrilled to be able to be working with people that had something like this and, and were so proud and enthusiastic about it. And you know, I've, I've worked with hundreds of geologists and uh, exploration people, engineers, uh, at Barrick, and you know, we, we at, at its peak, we produced over nine million ounces of gold a year, and we had 27 mines. And um, to be able to uh, get in on the ground floor of something where uh, I could have uh, uh, an input in the team, bring you know some of my experience and and uh, my knowledge of uh, working and what the big companies are looking for in in juniors to take them over. It was a great opportunity, and so literally within days after I left Barrick, I, I I decided to join uh, Probe. And uh, four months later, we actually sold the company. I, I, I wasn't expecting that, but we, we sold the company for, for, for over $500 million to Gold Corp. And Gold Corp, t uh, still to this day, is a shareholder in the sp spin-off company that uh, uh, Probe Metals that um, was um, spun out to shareholders. Um, and, and so that was a great opportunity. It was a very unexpected situation. Um, we, I think, uh, got an offer that was uh, extremely attractive. Uh, we were in the midst of developing the mine, but the great thing about that was we kept the management team together. Gold Corp uh, enabled us to keep almost $20 million of cash, and we've used that to hopefully ha may have a lightning strike twice. Uh, so. Long story short, uh, I, I somehow uh, luckily um, caught on with uh, three of the most incredibly uh, gifted, knowledgeable, and experienced executives in the business, and, hit, and that's where we are now. The question that's been coming my way the whole time, and Patrick's not going to believe me, but Patrick, the question is, okay, in Ecuador you go and find a huge project. You go to Northern Ireland where there's no gold in Northern Ireland, other than the fact that you hear that at the, at the bottom of a rainbow there's a pot of gold. How did you come to find the deposits that you have found? And how does, let's say, for example, Dalradian stand up to Aurelian, which was a company that you had before? <coughs> Thanks, Ivan. Uh, the Aurelian story is pretty, pretty fascinating. That, that came out of a time of desperation after the Briex scandal in 97. There wasn't a lot of work for geologists, and I was a field geologist, and suddenly we found ourselves uh, in, in a time where there wasn't a lot of employment in the industry. So uh, we'd, another geologist and I had been successful in finding deposits in South America, diamond deposits, base metal deposits, and, and some gold. And we, we sat together one night in, in a bar and said, well, what are you going to do next? And we'd been reading a, a history of the conquest of the Indies at the time and, and had read about an area in, in Ecuador where there had been a history of gold mining in the time of the conquistadors. But there wasn't any gold mining there currently. So we thought, well, that's a good place to start. Uh, so we pulled our resources and uh, followed that, that idea that there was historic gold mining in an area that wasn't recognized in, in the modern mining industry. So we drove off into the mountains and six years later we walked out with a 14 million ounce gold deposit. Um, which in Ecuador wasn't as great as it sounds. It, it's a, it was an area where in the time that we'd been there we saw the mining code change five or six times. There was a coup uh, laws and regulations were pretty fluid. Uh, they were asked, you know, brown paper bags were asked for, filled with cash, and uh, security was difficult at times. So when Ken Ross rang us up and said, hey, you know, do you want to go for a coffee and discuss selling your project, we thought it was a pretty good time to exit. After the sale of Aurelian, to, from that concept to a sale of um, uh, $1.2 billion, 
uh, eight years later. I thought, well, you know, I'm still pretty young. Should go out and find the, find the next one. And I uh, went around the world looking at deposits in, in different jurisdictions. And I was having dinner one night with a friend of mine who was the head of the Geological Survey of Northern Ireland. And he said, you know, there, there is historical gold in Northern Ireland. Um, it's just because of the, the, the troubles and because of the history of the area where it is, no one's really been able to advance it. And it's been you know, put aside and forgotten. So I, I grabbed a mining engineer um, and flew over to this site. And I looked at it as a geologist and thought, wow, this is going to be millions of ounces. And uh, the mining engineer said, well, yeah, if this were in Canada, it, it would be gone. It would be a mine. So with that confidence, uh, we, we bought it. This is now eight years ago. And in the ensuing eight years, we've shown that there's six million ounces of gold and room to grow more. We've wrapped one good feasibility study around it, and we're um, and I'm going to tell you the story in a minute, so I'll, I, I, won't, I won't ruin it. Um, so I won't ruin it. Yeah, did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So most of the time, so now we've got oh, Doc, one second. Ireland, what happens when you try and explore in Northern Ireland? Surely the, the regulations change the game considerably and what you can do in the way of a mine in Ireland is not what you could do in the way of a mine in South America. Actually, from our point of view, we prefer more regulation. We prefer that, that certainty of uh, future, whereas in, in South America, the jurisdictions we've been into are actually the to work the higher standards, even if the regulations weren't uh, you know, top of class or, or good environmental regulations, we would still follow those standards in, in South America. But actually go somewhere where it's in place, where there's rule of law, and where if anything goes wrong, we have recourse to uh, third party arbitration um, as we are with the, a nationalization of those. Uh, I much prefer the first world as just one of the first part of my career working in areas where so much uncertainty around the non-geological aspects of the project. Great. Thank you. Okay, now we have with us the new company, Northern Empire, out of Las Vegas. Is this where you go and uh, bet something? I don't think so. But, Mike, if you wouldn't mind just telling us, why should Las uh, Vegas be even a, an area that we should be looking at? Um. Well, there's a lot of reasons to, to look at Nevada as a, as a jurisdiction for, for mining exploration. Um, simply put, Nevada is probably one of the, the tier one jurisdictions for, for mining. You do have rule of law. Uh, you do have, have a, a good, strong uh, regulatory regime and a transparent permitting process so that if you make that, that significant discovery, there is a, a place and you can actually bring a mine into, into development. Uh, the timeline for development of a, of a mine for, from a regulatory point of view in Nevada is about three years, so it's a, a relatively quick process. Um, the other part uh, of why people should be exploring in Nevada is geologically, I would argue it's the best. Um, if you look at the, the big companies uh, on a global scale that are, are mining, uh, you talk about the big three, Kinross, Barrick, Newmont the majority of their production, or at least a, a, a good chunk of it, is based in Nevada because it has that stable jurisdiction, excellent deposits, access to, to skilled workers that make the mines in, in Nevada. They might not be a, as high grade as some of the uh, other deposits in the rest of the world, but they're very profitable due to their efficiency that can, that can be done there. Uh, Northern Empire, with our, our location, we are two hours outside of, of Las Vegas. Uh, it's a, obviously it's a, a city that anybody in the in the world can get to uh, very quickly. I can be back and forth to, to site from my desk in Vancouver in 36 hours, and we can actually get anything that you would need for a mining operation is a, is two hours away in Las Vegas. So it's a very logistically simple project to to execute.